this Friday. Hi, sir. Recording has started. Hello everyone and um, welcome to this uh, webinar session. This is the 20th uh, in our series from the Mares team. Uh, Mares, as uh, most of you would know, is the marine aquaculture, reefs, renewable energy and ecotourism for ecosystem services, technical assistance program that the ADB has put together in 2020. Uh, the TA is currently supporting project identification and uh, investment plan preparation in two countries uh, in the Pacific. One is Palau, the other is the Marshall Islands. There's also been a lot of interest uh, from the ASEAN, uh, from a couple of other countries as well. Uh, so the webinar is um, our attempt to spread the word uh, on what's possible uh, at this confluence of this very diverse uh, uh, set of activities. And so today we have uh, Dr. Stefan Kran, uh, who will be uh, talking to us about seaweeds. Now, uh, let me, he, he's currently based in Ireland, uh, where he is uh, uh, doing some amount of scoping work. Uh, let me hand it over to him to take us through uh, a presentation on the work he's doing, and then we'll follow up with some questions uh, that may be relevant in terms of how this could be taken forward. Uh, in the ADB uh, and DMC system. Thank you so much. All right, Len, thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and especially thanks to Nick for actually inviting me to this uh, webinar series, the 20th I heard, so well done and many more to come, no doubt. I'll start sharing my screen now and then I'll kick off. Now, just have to see. Can everybody see this properly? Yes, it's come through, Stefan. Very good. OK, so yeah, my name is Stefan Kraan. I'm the uh, chief scientific officer of uh, a company called The Seaweed Company. Not a company, but The Seaweed Company. Very important because there are many seaweed companies nowadays. Because the subject has become quite popular over the last five years, as you have seen in the media or in the newspapers or other or clips on, on social media. And what I want to tell you today uh, is a little bit about the blue economy and how seaweed fits in that concept. And the blue economy, as you know yourself, it, it's uh, something also that has been coming to the forefront in maybe the last five to seven years, where there is a lot of activity going on and looking at our oceans as the last bastion, basically, uh, that is still a bit unexplored, is uh, very important for our survival and livelihoods, and how can we manage that in, in a sustainable way. Seaweeds fit very nice in that concept, but that will be clear later on. So the blue economy, and uh, you might all have seen this, this is from the World Bank, um, and their definition of blue economy is a sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs and an ocean ecosystem health. And it's basically uh, based on five pillars. Uh, one is renewable energy, and then you have to think of, of tidal energy or uh, wind turbines and things like that. But also in that uh, category fits seaweed biomass, for example, which you can then ferment to ethanol, and then, then you have basically your bioethanol from a sustainable resource. Because the good thing with seaweeds is, it doesn't take uh, land mass uh, to, to, to be cultivated. It doesn't need fertilizers. We just had a discussion before we got on about fertilizers and the price has basically gone up almost tenfold. So there is there's a lot of benefits there also for renewable energy. Now, fisheries, of course, a very clear cut one. Uh, we are very dependent for food and protein from our oceans and that can be fisheries, but it can also be aquaculture, of course. Uh, where we cultivate our fish and in this case seaweed, for example, as well. And later on, I show you that seaweed, it, it's a huge industry actually, and not many people realize this. Then maritime transport, shipping, uh, two and a half percent of all CO2 emitted on this globe is coming from shipping. 
very important in that uh, aspect, but of course also just for transporting of goods. Tourism, you had a few webinar series, uh, I believe, on sustainable tourism. Again, that's another pillar in this blue economy and then climate change. Now, normally, uh, the waste management I don't mention, and it is only because I saw this in here, in this uh, nice infographics, that uh, I started looking at that. And of course, yeah, waste management, immediately you think of plastics. And, and that is still a huge problem, especially for our oceans, because now nano and microplastic is basically in, in everything. Uh, there was just recently a, a small clipping uh, published in a newspaper in, in the Netherlands that even the steak on my plate or my pork chop, they all contain microplastics which is quite shocking, to be honest. So that is another huge issue. So blue economy in a nutshell. <clears throat> and what we also have seen over the last couple of years is that a lot of investment investment funds start to jump on this, start to look at environmental impact from an environmental point of view, of course, but also social impact, providing job security for people living at uh, around coastal areas. And if there's 3 billion people actually reliant on that ocean system, and they're talking about 350 million jobs around the ocean-based sectors, it is an, a very important sector for well, human survival in a way. And they have been looking at this uh, for investment opportunities, and what they quote is basically every dollar you put in, you get five in return in global benefits. So that is not a direct return on investment for an investor, so venture capitalists, they're probably not too happy with this, but we are looking at other funds that really look at social impact and environmental impact. And that is a, a growing group, and there is a lot of money currently available to develop these projects on those five pillars I just mentioned for uh, Blue Economy. So, and back to those five pillars, because uh, waste management I, I don't mention in here, but there is another one, but that could be seen as environmental, which is blue carbon. So it's the seaweed, and the purpose of this talk is to tell you a little bit more uh, about the seaweed. And then offshore wind, of course, fisheries, agriculture, sustainable shipping, and blue carbon. And of course, why is it so important? Important. Well, the oceans, they make up 70% of the whole Earth's surface. So from a climate perspective and from a food perspective, hugely important. So seaweed, um, and, and this comes from a report I worked with, with a group in Europe, uh, that was seaweed uh, for Europe. We have been looking at figures and what it could do. We, we know what it already does worldwide, but what it could do for the European sector. And we are looking at a market by 2030 of 9.3 billion and about 115,000 jobs. So we really could start to make a dent in, in uh, aquaculture processing, uh, product development, all these kind of things from seaweeds in Europe. And it is a, a very uh, novel market yet. There's only a few players in there, in Norway, in Ireland, ourselves, of course, and, and in France, but it is a market that is growing. But there's also challenges because it is still very novel and these uh, blue economy ocean funds are only just starting. So there's still a lack of access to finance and uh, commercial scalability. Um, it is difficult to, to, for, to, to provide investors actually with a solid revenue stream so that they actually will invest. Um, th there is a lot of bottlenecks still. And we trying with, with amongst them, these kind of presentations to spread the word that we are sitting here in a way on a gold mine. But people have to realize um, what to do, how to do it, and then prove it and show it with the numbers. And then the money will come. And, and we are living proof of that already. So globally, I just mentioned that it is a big industry. If you look at uh, seaweed production, and we, we call this phycognometrics, by the way, phyco uh, phycology is the, is the study of seaweeds, then there's two countries in the world, China and Indonesia, that are the biggest producers. They are good for about, I think, 65, 70% of all seaweed produced. And there is, uh, and this is already an old figure from last year, 34 million tons. Apparently, that is now already uh, 
36.8 million tons of seaweed produced, which is a lot of seaweed. And that is still growing, and now especially with Europe jumping the bandwagon, uh, growing with 6 to 8 percent a year. All the seaweed that is harvested uh, is grown for at least 97 percent. Only in uh, parts in Europe, and again Ireland or Iceland and Norway, but also uh, Chile and Peru, there is wild harvest still going on, but that is something that is slowly disappearing. For one, because seaweed and seaweed forests provide ecosystem services. And that is starting to be more frowned upon that these uh, forests are basically harvested for, well, profit and gain while destroying an ecosystem. So I, I give that another 10, 15 years, and then uh, at least in Europe, by EU degree, probably that whole wild harvesting will be stopped. So everything has to be cultivated. Uh, and then if you look at the return, uh, the compact annual growth rate, you're talking about more than 10% for the next uh, couple of years. So seaweed cultivation, uh, 34 million, well, actually a little bit more now. If you purely look at the raw dried seaweed, so you grow the seaweed, you dry it, and you export it to wherever, then that business is about 7 billion. But as soon as you start going into processing, there is a lot of extra money coming in. If you look at the top 10 producers, what I said, China, Indonesia are number one and number two, but number three, the Philippines. And actually, the whole red seaweed cultivation started uh, by uh, Mr. Trono at the time in the 70s with certain strains, the bohol strain, of a, a seaweed that produces carrageenan. And that strain has been used throughout the Philippines, of course, also in Indonesia, and then started to make its way to India, to Mozambique, to Kenya, and now even in Brazil. And that was not a smart thing to, to do, because for one, now with the Nagoya protocols, you can't move uh, genetic resources around anymore, but they did in the past. These strains in other countries now start to have issues with all kinds of diseases and stuff. So if you want to grow seaweeds uh, locally, you have to come up with your own strains, not bring in genetic resources from somewhere else, because in the long term, it always starts to create problems, local problems. So what I said, if you start processing and, and doing something with the seaweed, then market sizes and, and money coming in for uh, processing and product development is actually huge. You jump from 7 billion to 16 or 18 billion, and even certain uh, marketing reports are having a much higher uh, number in there. But the message from this is uh, 2020, we're talking about 40 billion in the graph here at the bottom right and going to 2027 to 95 billion. Now, we are talking about uh, supermarket products on the shelf that are incorporated in these figures, of course. So what kind of problems can seaweeds address? Well, we're just talking about the fertilizer. My own company, we are actually selling a biostimulant. Uh, especially for those kind of purposes. And with the biostimulant, we have now proven with soil samples and all these kind of things that we can bring 11 tons of CO2 or carbon, sorry, back into the soil. And that is a very interesting uh, concept now, where if we look at what is happening with blue carbon and the money being paid and the investments being made, and also project on that the rising fertilizer prices, I think we have a very good value proposition here. Ocean restoration, and in this case, uh, deacidification. If you grow seaweeds, they take up CO2. CO2 is the stuff that makes, of course, the oceans more acidic, and in that way, you extract the CO2 out of the oceans. So that is a good thing to help, <clears throat> because the less acidic, the better the coral reefs will grow. And that, of course, is the, the start of the whole reef ecosystem. Sustainable diets, uh, no brainer in a way. You have to move as a society from uh, animal to plant based diets anyway, because, as you all know, in the long term, more people on this planet, the, we, we can't uh, sustain this type of, of eating or feeding uh, that we currently have. So we have to change uh, our behavior and seaweeds would fit very nicely in that sustainable diet uh, thing. Climate mitigation already mentioned CO2, so that makes sense. 
And it also depends on what you do with the CV, because this is something that I want to warn you for. There is a lot of hype and hoopla about, oh, we grow seaweed, so we take up CO2 and we just sequester CO2. No, that is nonsense. Seaweed can take up CO2, yes, but then it depends what you do with the seaweed. If you use it for food or feed or as a fertilizer, then often the, the, the CO2 is released again and comes back into the atmosphere. So seaweed is more a transfercation of CO2, where it is stored in the seaweed and then depending on what you do if you make uh, building material with the seaweed yes you can sequester it for a long time if you make biochar with the seaweed and goes into the soil yes you can sequester for a long time but just growing seaweed is not enough to claim oh we sequester seaweed uh, coastal ecosystems if you have seaweed farms in front of the coast they will dampen waves uh, and energy, they, they take out the energy, so you have less land erosion, you get mangrove systems, and mangroves are also very good in taking up CO2. And of course, then finally, the bioactive compounds in the seaweeds, ranging uh, from, from antioxidants to uh, compounds that uh, help prevent actually obesity. We have a big impact on human health and well-being. <coughs> And, and as an example, we, we are running a project with the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And we have already proven in mice and rats that certain sterols from a particular type of seaweed that we cultivate in Ireland has an effect against Alzheimer's, against the, the plaque forming in the brain. Now, that is something, and that is going to be a long road, 10, 15 years with the clinical trials, but it, it gives indications there's a lot of stuff in seaweeds that we only start to discover. The thing with seaweeds as well is we are tapping into a couple of mega trends. Uh, we, we've heard of uh, the sea spiracy uh, uh, documentary, uh, Kiss the Ground, all these kind of things. So there is in social media, Netflix, there's a lot of stuff that is pushing this ball forward. Uh, uh, all about mainly climate mitigation, environmental restoration. There is a lot of policies coming out from governments, uh, the EU Green Deal, for example, the blue economy that I just mentioned, that is uh, put the wind in our sails in a way. Uh, circular economics, where you take up nutrients from runoff from land with the seaweed and then use it back as an additive, for example, in feed for cattle. So you can start uh, circulating nutrients, nitrates and phosphates. Um, a lot of, yeah, I would say kind of hype is still around seaweed now, uh, which then starts a lot of people with, with small companies, entrepreneurs looking at solutions, which is also helpful. Not always, by the way. Um, and then there is a lot of people that want to make impact. And our company is the same. We really want to make social and environmental impact. And you see here a small picture that is Steve Miller or Meller from Australia. He is the one who's growing the Asparagopsis at the moment for a feed additive in cattle in Australia to reduce the methane. Now, mind you, only in Australia this is approved as a feed additive. Europe is still sitting at the fence because there's also some negative issues with this. Uh, but if that is going to be approved, then also in Europe this will take off in a certain part of the market. So seaweeds will be one of the global inputs uh, that humanity will utilize for sustainable consumption and production. That is number one. But with that, only sustainable, traceable, equitable, commercial sound supply of uh, chain of seaweeds will enable suitable, uh, sustainable growth and bring value benefits to us all. So it has to be fair and equitable. And only a regenerative, nature positive business will be here to stay. And business using seaweeds is part of that uh, solution. And you address a lot of the uh, SDGs uh, from, from zero hunger down to uh, life on land, if you have recircular bioeconomy or use it as a biostimulant and everything in between. Now, just to, to show you a couple of examples of what you can do with, with seaweeds, and uh, in this case, we, we talk about the, the sargassum, for example, in the Caribbean. They now, in certain places, used, use it as a building material. They just compress bricks out of the dried biomass and build houses locally for, for, for the locals. 
but you can also make cardboard, for example, from it, uh, which you see in the top uh, right corner. That this is a cover of a book, by the way. But other things like plant pots, uh, if you kind of um, process it a little bit more, uh, you see here the the soles of sneakers. And now that is from a microalgae, but it is the same principle. It's the protein derived from that, where they make a foam, and the same with the surfing board. And then at the bottom left, that is a lady that we work with in uh, in the Netherlands, and she makes seaweed. So it's it's a combination of seaweed fiber with wood fiber, and it is for one as decorative material, but also as an insulation material. The other one that we briefly mentioned was plastics, and plastics present a huge opportunity, I think, for seaweed. Uh, if you look at Indonesia. They produce about 10 million tons of uh, carrageenan, of, of seaweed that is used for carrageenan and agar, which are food additives. But there is another 1.2 million hectares available in Indonesia to grow seaweeds. And we have with partners in, in, in Indonesia already developed uh, certain types of plastics, uh, plastics that are 100% made from seaweed, but also plastics that are 96% made from seaweed. There's some sorbitol and um, uh, glycerol in there, but they can make really strong plastics. And with the one where you have a bit of sorbitol and glycerol, it's a non-stick plastic as well, so it can go on rolls and used as packaging material. Now this is all in development, but if you look at the amount of plastic that we actually uh, dump and what is going into to the oceans, it's huge. We're talking about billions of tons. And that was a shocking kind of metric for me as well, where you see 79% of all world's plastics that end up in landfills and ultimately up in the oceans, which is scary. But it also explains why we find microplastics now in almost everything. So big opportunity with seaweed plastic and the good thing of seaweed plastic within three, four weeks, it's gone. It's biodegraded. So the other things that we have been doing with, with uh, my own company then is Develop two concepts. One is blue farming, where we use the seaweed fertilizer, seaweed biostimulant to replace the, the chemical fertilizers. So by just doing that, uh, you use a hell of a lot of CO2 per kilo fertilizer less. You can prevent pesticides in most cases, but it depends a little bit on the crop. We also, what I mentioned, can bring in uh, carbon back into the soil. Uh, 13 tons per hectare. You, depending if you use it in animal feed, can get a better feed conversion ratio. So you need less feed to get to the same weight in the animal. And also the methane issue that we have in cattle, we can address with seaweeds. Now, it's not as good as that one particular seaweed that they have in Australia, although we can cultivate it here as well, but it's just not approved yet. But seaweeds in general, because of the polyphenols, uh, which are a type of antioxidants, they can reduce methane emissions by 10 to 20 percent. And then the whole nitrate emissions uh, issue, if you have a better food conversion ratio, so you basically use all the amino acids or the protein in the feed to make muscle mass, there is less protein coming through the back door, which is converted to, into ammonia. So that is another big uh, kind of profit with using seaweeds in an animal uh, diet. And the other concept that we're really trying to carry out is uh, blue health, where you tackle human health and well-being, of course, and again, ocean re regeneration, because if you grow the seaweeds, you can take up the CO2, uh, you prevent the acidification. And those seaweeds and those bioactives can be applied in different ways. Uh, one is health supplements that we are currently making, and that can be simple pills where you have uh, dried and milled seaweeds from different species that have certain bioactives that can boost the immune system. And it's, by the way, all these things are <coughs> peer reviewed proven because the science has already been done on all these bioactives. Uh, you can use it in cosmetics. And again, science already proven. Uh, we know that certain elements from brown seaweeds, Fucoidin, it's called, has a profound effect on, on skin cells, in this case, fibroblasts that are under the epidermis. And fibroblasts make collagen. So theoretically, if you use this stuff in your face cream, it would basically uh, make your wrinkles go away because you produce more collagen. 
And finally, of course, food. Um, one of the things we have been doing is putting this in meat as a replacement of meat. And you and I, we, we all know if, if you're a meat eater, then you're not becoming overnight a vegetarian. So what we have been looking at is how can we replace meat? And then we're mainly talking about burgers and sausages and, and processed meat, of course. But we have now a concept where we use 40% of seaweed in burger meat. And that still is perceived by the consumer as non-noticeable, giving the same bite, giving the same juiciness. And by the end of this year, these burgers will go into the shops now. And the concept is, uh, you can see here, where we replace 40% with a particular type of seaweed. And what I said, we have done all the taste trials, have taste panels, all this kind of stuff to, to go through this. But if you look at the, uh, the metrics and the amount of uh, phosphate, CO2, uh, water, land occupation you use to make a normal burger and one of ours, there's a huge difference. And that is an easier way, I think, to wean people off meat than telling people to go directly to a plant-based diet because that won't work, not at this stage yet. So that is one concept uh, for health and well-being. And with that, of course, uh, you, you, you change your Nutri-score. That is a kind of thing that we have in Europe where you can see with the uh, A, B, C, D, E if something is healthy or not. Now, normally standard hamburgers fall in D or E, and by doing this, you immediately get it to a B or sometimes even an A, depending what you use uh, beside the seaweed. And then the whole salt, re salt reduction by using seaweed, the umami that actually gives a, a different uh, or a better taste as well, fiber that you introduce in your burger. So there is a lot of benefits. Uh, iodine, for example, that comes with the seaweed, and of course, uh, reduce saturated fat content. So to sum it up, all what I've been telling, um, seaweed, very good in taking up CO2, but also nitrogen and a little bit of phosphorus. So that is for every ton of seaweed. And with that in mind, you can really start to look at seaweeds as an extractive kind of aquaculture product. If you, for example, grow fish, it's the other way around. You actually emit through feces and, and uh, urine, a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus into the water. But with this, you can extract and take everything out. And then depending on what you do with the seaweed, you can really sequester it and fix it or move it on. And in the right one, you can see all the different things we were talking about, food, fertilizer, plastics, uh, health, et cetera, et cetera. So, that was on, on, on Blue Health, Blue Farming. And, and finally, uh, the last thing is the uh, ecosystem services, the envi environmental impact and social impact, basically, where again, CO2 plays a big role, what you can do for the coral reefs, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen uh, recycling, uh, so a circular bioeconomy, um, high in potassium, so very important for agricultural crops. And finally, providing jobs by growing seaweed, so a huge social impact. There are still some current gaps, and that is, uh, and the, the webinar like today is, is a very good one because you create aware, awareness of the blue economy and seaweeds in general. But there's a couple of things there that have to be addressed if we want to make this bigger and, and start to really take off. But there is a lot of opportunities. And what I said, uh, especially around bioplastics, that could be a huge driver at the moment. Um, the changes in uh, biodiversity laws, uh, ecosystem services, what I said, wild harvesting will probably be stopped very soon. It all has to be cultivated. And of course, the opportunities that with seaweed cultivation, seaweed use, seaweed processing, you address many of the United the the SDGs, Sustainable De Development Goals. Now, just four slides to finish off. That is just to give you a, a flavor or impression how seaweed cultivation looks like and what we are doing ourselves uh, in Ireland, in Morocco, in India, and in the Netherlands. 
And it is based all around innovation. And this looks very messy, but it is uh, a way to automatically seed ropes or nets and deploy them automatically into the sea. So the whole hatchery phase we basically take away. And oh, this, I don't know if this is going to work, but this is something we do as offshore cultivation. You see this big boat here with a big module on the side. That is an automatic harvester that takes all the seaweed off the nets when it's growing. And just tell me if this works. It's a two minute clip, I think. Yeah, it's running. Okay, it gives you an idea at least of, of the scale. This is in the North Sea, about 20 miles offshore. And this is where it's all heading to, that we want to start growing larger amounts of biomass that we can then use and ultimately grow so much biomass, for example, in the North Sea, that we can make the step to ethanol, to energy production, for example. Because at the moment it's still way too expensive to use it for something like ethanol. So that's where we, we see the nets. Of, and that is the farm in the Netherlands. But yeah, it, it is uh, just the flavor. So, so this is how Ireland looks like on a, on a sunny day, by the way. Not always the case. Um, but growing seaweeds on ropes, on nets, um, and harvesting them. Uh, this year we had our first 20 tons uh, developed. We scale up next year to 500 tons, and in year three it's going to go to 1,000 tons. Now, in the larger scheme of things, that's nothing. But for us, and as a start in Europe, is really good. Farm in the Netherlands, same thing, but this is a much smaller farm. Then Morocco, where we do green seaweeds uh, near near uh, Nador, where we have a big lake where we harvest this green seaweed. And then in India, where I was talking about on, on uh, in Lakswa Deep, where we grow Crassalaria, for example. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, let the questions come. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stefan. That, that was a really um, interesting presentation. You know, it covered so many different aspects, you know, looking at uh, industrial applications, looking at uh, animal feed, aquaculture, you know, biomedicine. So, so, so many different aspects in terms of seaweed is, is getting used. And so that was uh, quite illuminating uh, for our audience. Um, a couple of questions, um, and since I'm the moderator, I'll, I'll uh, uh, use my prerogative to ask the first question. Um, one of the issues, and I work in the Pacific, and and so you know um, we're dealing with energy sector, um, you know transitions in the Pacific. A lot of the Pacific Island countries have you know come out with very ambitious goals on you know decarbonizing in, in five years or ten years, and and what you're noticing is most of these are you know diesel economies. Um, and the grids are weak and, and, you know, trying to import solar and battery storage. Um, well, it, it's it's fine for the initial phases, but as you increase the intensity, it gets very complex. There's also been this view expressed in a few countries about could we be, you know, keeping our uh, fuel ecosystem in place, but then, you know, changing our fuel uh, to maybe biofuels or more, you know, third generation uh, kind of fuels. And, uh, of course, what's holding that back today is, uh, is is scale and price. And so, of course, you've mentioned how things are today in terms of uh, seaweeds. I'm curious in terms of um, when you look at that transition, um, what's the kind of scale that that one would need to get, you know, to, to be able to get this pricing down to something comparable when you talk of, you know, sh shifting to ethanol? I mean, if you could just give us a sense of that, I think that would be helpful. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of the smaller countries in the Pacific or even in ASEAN, South Asia, East Asia, they have fairly large, uh, you know, um, you know, offshore um, resources. Uh, and therefore, the whole idea of, you know, can they use their e exclusive economic zones to be, to be able to generate value uh, in different ways, maybe for fuel, but maybe also for exporting seaweed. I think we'll, we'll love to hear a little more from you in terms of the implications for you know the energy system as well as uh, export purposes and value addition yeah. uh, for some of these smaller countries. Thanks. 
Oh, th thanks for the question, Len. Um, first of all, if we look at energy, and I've done the calculations, I published this as well in a paper 10, 10 years ago, I think. The size of the country Luxembourg is what we need of seaweed cultivation to uh, supply 50% of all ethanol use currently in, in the EU. And the size of country Luxembourg sounds big, but if you project that in the North Sea or even in the English Channel, it's not that big. The only problem is that if you have a huge farm like that, if it's one piece, you get nutrient problems. Because what's growing in the middle is probably getting water that is completely stripped of nutrients before it arrives there. So having mega farms like that, that's never going to work. You can work in, in modules uh, of one square kilometer and then dotted them uh, around different places that that could work very well. But that is the, the, the size you look at. And that is then for, for Europe as an example. If you look at uh, smaller countries in the Asian Pacific, the easiest step for them, and I'm now particularly looking at Fiji, for example, they have a big issue with a red seaweed that is blooming. And this all has to do with warmer temperatures, more nutrient runoff, and suddenly you get these blooms. We have uh, looked at biodigesters, of course, where seaweed, and it depends on the type of seaweed, some seaweeds need co-fueling with something else, but m there are seaweeds that can be digested on their own, and you can produce basically your meat and gas, compress it, bottle it, use it for home cooking and for other things. So there could be a self-reliant uh, system being developed. We're currently working with OCP, the, the biggest phosphate mine in, in Morocco, and doing exactly that near uh, Layoun, that is in uh, Western Sahara, where everything has to be imported, including energy. So one of the things is uh, establishing a biodigester there, run that, produce their own gas, use the freshwater runoff, by the way, from the biodigester, use that for uh, hydroponic systems so they can grow their own vegetables. And now the only thing they still have to import is wheat to make bread. So th there is a lot of things that you can do. It, it is often a puzzle piece, but not the complete solution. So for, for islands in the Pacific, I would say biodigester is, is a very obvious one uh, because they will not probably go to these kind of scale uh, type of, of modules to grow so much biomass that they can easily start making ethanol because you have to go to a price of 10 cents a kilowatt. And currently we are at one euro to two euros a kilowatt in, in, in the best case scenario, by the way. So that, that, that would be something that I would suggest uh, looking at the biodigester uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kran. Uh, let's let's just look through. Nick, do you have any questions coming in from the Mares concept? Yes, we, we also have. Yes, we do have a few questions. questions. They are. Panels. They are. Yeah. And Anna um, asked a question part the way or put her hand up part the way through. But there's a couple of questions in the chat already. And I've got a question. Uh, great. When it comes so shall we start with Andy? Uh, I think he's he's put his question up there first. Andy, do you want to unmute and, and read your question out? So this is this is more a question around you know what 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 is it that countries have done or governments have done to help enable you know this this uh, transition and uh, you know organization for seaweeds and making it easier for producers. Uh, so again, in terms of you know when you when you worked with some of the countries you spoke about, you know you're looking at something in Lakshadweep, you're looking at something in uh, you know in northern Africa, you're looking at Fiji. Um, is this largely coming from the resource there, or are you also looking at you know, interventions from the government in terms of, you know, making it easier for uh, for this kind of innovation to take place? Well, uh, Lakshwadeep, definitely, because we work with the government, we work with the local governor, because uh, the social impact, job creation, uh, we, we need to see it for our own production in, in Europe for animal feed. So it's a win-win in, in, in a way. So there is government interventions to help developing for definite. Uh, other places, sometimes you just run into basically a brick wall. <laughs> so it's not always clear cut. 
Uh, and actually here in Ireland, it is more difficult than, for example, to, to establish it in Lakshwadeep. Uh, but, but again, so that the nature of support is, is it more of, you know, uh, let's say, an, you know, support for identifying where this projects could come up? Is it about providing some kind of, let's say, an investment, um, you know, credit? Uh, are, are you seeing kind of fiscal instruments or, you know, monetary instruments, you know, coming in to play some role? Definitely. I mean, as a company, we, we do invest ourselves. Uh, if, if we really see a huge opportunity, we, we put in the money partially ourselves. And then with government subsidies and other things, we try to balance that and then start uh, either setting up a JV with a local organization or going there ourselves. So from, from that perspective, yes, uh, because to fund everything yourself is, 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 well, unless you make a hell of a lot of profit, but otherwise that's not doable. We also try to team up with different uh, kind of aspects in, in the blue economy. For example, we are now looking at a, a project in Bangladesh where we combine sustainable tourism with seaweed farming. And there is in Bangladesh a huge opportunity. There is a small amount of farmers already growing, but they just uh, dry it and it's, they send it to Myanmar. And that's it. But Bangladesh itself could enormously upscale seaweed production process and that can be uh, not even the high value critical co2 extraction no just low processing and add value and that would be a, a good money spinner i think for the government so it's things like that uh, depending on the situation and what you say site uh, survey is very important but if you already have a small indigenous community already growing there well you know it, it grows there and it works Indonesia, that is, a, is another one that has enormous potential still, and they already grow a lot. And one of the things that I do from uh, as a job, I, I work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, and I coach 14 seaweed companies in Indonesia for export to Europe and to make them export ready uh, with uh, quality control, uh, all the rules and regulations, everything around that. And they start to have issues, for example, with China coming in. They were allowed to set up companies in Indonesia and now they're competing, but they get, for example, a 17% rebate if they send it back to China, the product. So it creates a false competition. So I'm trying to make these companies in Indonesia see, okay, guys, you make uh, agar and kariginen, that's fine, that's a core business, but look, you can also make bioplastics. Look, you can also make fertilizer or uh, a feed or other things that you can do with the seaweed. So it's basically, I try to open their eyes, think outside the box. Yeah, and, and you're trying to get them up the value chain. So that, that's yeah, really interesting. Exactly, exactly. Great. Uh, Karina, uh, uh, she again had an interesting question. Karina, do you want to ask a question? I think this is more about, uh, you know, what is it that's, uh, you know, appropriate in terms of uh, production? Thank you. Yes, I was thinking about a uh, great presentation, by the way. I was thinking about contexts where it's not possible to bring in heavy machinery or or sort of high tech type of um, uh, equipment. Do you have any examples where uh, you can still process seaweed and, and get something fruitful and, and, and yeah, cost efficient out of it? Yeah, well, actually, 97 percent of all seaweed cultivated is the way you describe it. it it's Fishermen families, uh, mainly women that prepare long lines where they tie little seedlings to the ropes and it is all inshore. So we're talking about uh, a meter to three meters of depth, either staked to the to the bottom or uh, it's floating at the surface. So it's very, very low tech. And that is why uh, so many people actually grow seaweeds in these uh, areas, because it, it provides often the sole income for those families which then allows them to, to send the kids to school, for example. So it has a huge impact as well. But you see what we do, that is all for Europe, Western Europe, because we cannot afford all the labor cost. So we have to mechanize it. So we have to do automatic seeding, cut out the hatchery, do these huge kind of harvesting systems, because that is the only way how we can make it economically feasible. But as soon as you go to the Pacific, that is one thing that you're not going to implement because it would take away the jobs of so many people. Interesting. 
Len, um, a lady called Anna had her hand up part of the way through the presentation. I think it's Anna Batten. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's let's ask for her. Anna, are you uh, interested in asking a question? No, actually, it, it was a mistake. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> that, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. So I'm quite new to yeah. that topic, so but I'm uh, investigating it for our Coral Triangle Initiative of WWF. Yeah, so on this uh, sort of financing the opportunity side. But thanks a lot. Thank you, and thank you for joining. Uh, Nick, you had a question uh, that you wanted to ask as well. Yeah, I do. I'm afraid I always have a question, especially when I listen to Stefan, because uh, it's such a... It's no it's promise almost, that I will answer it. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost too perfect, Stefan. It's it's um it's such a, a wonderful solution. It's, it's as I say, it's almost too too perfect. So I've got a two part question. One is technical, and the second one is around funding and scaling. And so the technical one is that under the Mara's TA, we've been looking at ocean thermal energy conversion (OTEC) as a potential uh, renewable yeah. energy solution in the case studies we talked about, uh, as in Palau and RMI. Um, that involves, if you go offshore, sucking out water from about a thousand meters down the water column. Um, that brings up a lot of cold water, obviously, and that puts a lot of nutrients into the, brings up nutrients from the from depth. Um, there's two aspects, and I'm, I'm not a clever bloke like you, so you can shoot me down if you wish. There's two aspects to that. One is that <clears throat> it helps counter the reduction in ocean current upwelling, which is occurring as a result of climate change. But there are potentially unintended consequences of bringing those um, those nutrients up, particularly if you did it into shallow water. Um, so one of the thoughts I had was, uh, could we be using seaweed cultivation as a method of uh, managing and absorbing those uh, those nutrients? So that's the first question, that's the technical one. The second question is you you put up on your final slide the, the issue of funding, the funding gap. One of the things that ADB is there to do is to uh, risk mitigate, is to do the investment to demonstrate capabilities um, that, that would otherwise be too risky for big corporates and, and private capitalists and so on to invest in. So how quickly could you scale? How, uh, if we said to you, we want to do, let's say, 100 square kilometers somewhere in the uh, Asia Pacific, not necessarily all together, not in one big square, obviously. Um, could you, how quickly could you scale? And how much, um, roughly, how much, what sort of funding um, would you require for that, roughly? Is, is that doable now, or is it 10, 15 years downstream is probably the better question? Well, first, going to you. <coughs> first part, uh, the OTEC, because Hawaii has one, eh? as, as I remember correctly, I think. Um, that would be a very good uh, solution to a nutrient overload problem, because this is what we already do basically in a lot of places in Europe. If you have your seaweed curtains, as we call it, around salmon farms, uh, close to shore in, in Brittany, for example, where there's a lot of runoff of nitrates and phosphates from, from pig farming. Yeah, you, you can take up these things. It's also what we're going to do now over the next year with uh, OCP, the, the, the phosphate, phosphate mining company in Morocco, because they uh, convey, I think, on conveyor belts from 40 kilometers inside the desert, phosphate rock to the pier in Layoun and then load ships and boats. But a lot of stuff is just spilling and falling, and there is leach it uh, from from water going in there. And we want to grow seaweeds there to take up the excess phosphate, for example. So we know from from a lot of studies that that seaweeds are very very good in taking up nitrates and phosphates. So if you bring up nutrient rich waters from a thousand meters of depth, not only the temperature, eh, you, you lower the temperature if you are in areas where uh, climate change is really bringing up the temperatures, it could lessen that effect, but also the nitrates and phosphates then could be taken up by the seaweeds and then you take them out and do something with that. But in that way, it's not causing any issues in the surrounding coral reef environment, for example. So that would be very good. Um, second part of the question, 100 square kilometer, nobody in the world could tackle that yet. 
Now, we can produce a lot of gametophytes, but it is specifically brown seaweeds that grow in temperate areas. So it depends very much in the Pacific where you are. If you're in, a, in an area which ranges between 10 to 20 degrees, yeah, we could do something with the brown seeds and the kelp, and that could be scaled up pretty quick. If the funding is there, we can go to 10, 20, 40 square kilometers. 100 is maybe a bit too much if you go directly to something like that, but step-wise, we could get there. But if it's really tropical, then you're uh, st stuck with basically red seaweeds, which are way smaller. Now, that can be grown vegetative, but it needs a relatively uh, calm environment. So if you go somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, yeah, you're probably going to lose most of your crop if, if the first tropical uh, cyclone or, or hurricane comes over it. With the kelp that we grow at colder temperatures, they're much more sturdier. And that wouldn't be an issue because they attach themselves to the rope with a hold fast. And you, you know yourself, they withstand storms, waves in winter uh, at the coastal area as well. So th that could work. Red seaweeds, less so. So depending on where you are in the Pacific, what temperature range, we can do it. If it's too hot, too tropical, we probably can't. Brilliant. Thanks, Stefan. You've got me thinking now. There's a question Hi. from Jeffrey Miller, I think, Len. Yeah, sure. No, that was a very smart question as well, Nick. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Miller, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm wondering about countries such as the Philippines or Indonesia. If there were a massive expansion in cultivation, what is the potential for a significant environment, negative environmental impact? Well, the, there is already a huge expansion uh, being developed over the last 20 years. Uh, with Indonesia producing 10 million tons of, of red seaweed. And that the only uh, effect it had is a social impact, but not an environmental one. As a matter of fact, you actually take out the CO2, reduce the nitrates and phosphates, so it is only beneficial to inshore coastal waters. So we, we don't see, uh, and, and we know from seaweed farms, there are not really negative issues. Uh, I would even add one extra there, all uh, tissue from seaweed farms that breaks off and falls into the sediment ends up, as they claim, and I still have to see that on, on paper, but they claim goes into the sediment, goes into the deep sea in the end. So you actually fix carbon, which would be another beneficial aspect. Okay, thank you. You were on mute, uh, Len. Ah, there you go. No, th 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 thank you, Jeffrey. That was an interesting question on the environmental impacts. Um, I'm just wondering um, if we have any more questions. I, I can ask questions forever. Um, Stefan, can you, uh, you mentioned sargassum. Um, uh, the, the uh, and um, that was one particular issue. And of course, I know you're working on uh, projects in the Caribbean, which is how we met. And, and thank you for your fab presentation. Could you just talk about that? Because um, there is a mega sargassum problem in the Caribbean. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there are similar problems in Asia PAC. Um, what, what are the opportunities and the, the, the pros and cons of going out there and industrially recovering sargassum? Uh, presumably in the sea before it gets to the beach, before it gets covered in muck, um, and using that commercially, please. Yeah. And, and I think the one that we talked about in the Caribbean, the, the supply chain went through to uh, producing cardboard, and there were some quite compelling numbers around um, replacing the UK's requirement for paper for um, well, you re remember that well, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Well done. No, um, looking, and, and you, you said, oh, the problem in the Caribbean and probably in the Pacific as well. No, not in the Pacific. It is a typical purely Caribbean problem. There is about 13, 15 million tons of this seaweed floating around. And it all has to do with runoff from Africa as well as from uh, Brazil, the, the Amazon. So that is your nutrient input. Then sand blown in from the Sahara that has iron in it that fertilizes uh, the, 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 the area there as well, which with a few degrees in temperature uh, rise in the water forms the optimum 
conditions for this seaweed suddenly to start growing madly. Because 10, 15 years ago, this was not an issue. It's only in the last 10, 15 years that is becoming uh, an issue, growing from 2 million tons to 7 to 13, 15. And we don't know where the end is. Uh, might be 20, 30 million tons uh, in, in the near future. There is ways to deal with this. Um, and, and what you said in this project, we are looking at this, uh, what we can do with it from biorefinery, biodigester, using it in, in, uh, as, as fertilizer, using it in, in poultry farms, for example, as feed additive. Many things you can do with it. Collection, that's a different thing. And here you again have uh, two options. And in first instance, I would work locally. And with the guys that are already there doing this, uh, SOS Carbon, for example, has a whole uh, system in place, for example, in the Dominican Republic. And that's local fishermen that get paid for every ton or every kilo wet that they bring in. That is a system that works. And I would tap into that in first instance. If you then scale up to a certain size that you can't handle this anymore with local, then you might start sending out barges and other uh, autonomic uh, vehicles to, to start recovering the sargassum. If you look at a biorefinery, you need about 150,000 tons to run something profitable. By the just digester might uh, probably need twice that amount. But if you look then at what is washing up in the Caribbean, and in this case, the Dominican Republic, it's still a small bit. So what you then have to do is to copy that model to other islands around it. And then you can start to make a dent in, in, in the sargassum and preferably take it away before it washes up on the beach and has an impact on tourism and other things. But that, that would be the approach. But clearly of a purely only a Caribbean issue at this moment, not in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, I'll let Andy go first and, and then we have uh, another question after that. Oh, hi. Uh, sorry. Yes, the banging stopped here. So thanks again, uh, Stefan. Just you mentioned briefly um, uh, a project in Bangladesh that links with ecotourism. Could you give a little bit more detail on that integration? Thanks. Well, that is still very uh, preliminary. Uh, we, we have just about to, to establish a joint venture there. But yeah, it, it's three islands that are uh, touristic islands. And what we try to do is to have people that come uh, for, for this aspect that they help and work in the different projects. Where we grow seaweeds, we also have sea turtles, for example, and tourists love sea turtles. So you can put them in a program where they either count sea turtles and, and uh, look at uh, what effect it has on the farm. They can help in the seaweed farm itself to either seed or harvest seaweeds. And then you have a, a, a what we say, farm to table experience where we actually use the local seaweeds in a dining experience uh, in the evening depending on what island we are and what kind of touristic amenities there are on an island like that but it is the combination of those two in giving tourists a different experience and and helping and uh, supporting locally what is happening instead of just being there uh, as an observer getting the experience and then they're gone again. Thanks, uh, right, thanks, thanks, Stefan. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, we we have two more questions. It looks like uh, so. Judek, Hans, Judek, um, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, we have uh, done a study in Martinique. We had this problem there also with the um, uh, the zargassum, and uh, the proposal we've made there to because the uh, uh, moisture content is so high it's something like 95 96 percent it's almost all water we have uh, proposed there to uh, use HTC hydrothermal carbonization uh, that means what we get out there is uh, carbon and that can be used as soil additive because Martinique has a very severe problem with an uh, agrochemical that was used in the 1950s and 1960s and has uh, soiled uh, 
contaminated a lot of uh, soil on Martinique, so that cannot be used for agriculture anymore. So that's something what uh, what we are trying to do there with the sargassum. No, oh, uh, very interesting. I would love to hear more on that, uh, Judith, because uh, biochar, as as we call it, then uh, this carbonization is mm -hmm. one way to actually yeah increase or or uh, vitalize soils. Right. There's so much already taken out, especially in the top layer all over the world, basically. Mm -hmm. It's only a few places where soils improve. So that could right. be a very good solution. Uh, mm -hmm. What, in respect of the agricultural chemical, I'm very curious what that was, because that must be some nasty stuff. Yeah, very, very bad. It's it's never uh, washed out. It stays in the soil. That was uh, for bananas. So the to protect the bananas against some insects, uh, that stuff was used, and there were, was a lot of shady uh, things going on. Uh, it was already yeah. forbidden, it was already forbidden, then they continued using it for 10 years, still, oh, wow. yeah. secretly, and so there's a lot of things going on. Yeah. But this HTC, I think, is a is a very interesting process, because what happens uh, is you, you uh, the water is actually not disturbing at all, you know, the water content, because it's a, it's a process where you put uh, the biomass into a big uh, tank under pressure and heat it up to uh, something like 280 degrees centigrade, and then it's carbonizing. Yeah. yeah? And the, you you keep the good thing is you keep the uh, minerals in the water so you can process the water for fertilizer or for whatever you want to yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you even go to I think 2,000 degrees and a bit more pressure, you change the carbon into diamonds. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's what that's. <laughs> but that might be a bit too costly uh, to do actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a, I think it's an interesting solution. I have uh, done a study for Kenya for the, the um, uh, water hyacinths there. Because oh, that's, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a, yeah, it's a very I'm big problem. I'm just going to put my uh, email in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, I would love to, if you contact me, because this we, we look at all solutions uh, mm -hmm. in the deck. Good, good. And this Great. could be a very good complementary kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There we go. So, thank you. Oh, that's that's a great connection. Um, cannot. Oh, there he is. Yeah, there he is. Okay, <laughs> get it. We have time. I think we, we're already on the hour. It's it's four o'clock. Uh, but we have time for one final question. Marcel, do you do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Stefan, we were presented projects to grow a, a specific strain of red seaweed on the coast of Africa. You're probably familiar with this specific strain it's called Asparagopsis taxiformis. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yes, and the idea yes. is to produce food complement for cattle with apparently very interesting properties, uh, including reduction of mass and uh, emission by, by the cattle. But then we heard about the controversy uh, from a study of the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Yeah, Wouter Muiselaar. Uh, yeah, yeah, showing that there could be traces of uh, toxic bromoform in the milk, which would compromise the food safety. So my question is, what are your views on the future for this specific use of seaweed in this context? Thank you. Very interesting, and thank you for the question, uh, Marcel. No, the, the the studies done in Wageningen were with a overdoses, first of all, uh, and not many people realized that, but they were feeding 300 or 400 grams of Asparagopsis per cow per day. And uh, this stuff is normally added at about six grams. There is an issue with bromoform, correct, but at normal use, six to ten grams per day per cow, they cannot find anything back in the milk. It does reduce methane by about 90 percent, so it's very good in that respect. But my issue is with the iodine in the species, because iodine is about 15,000 ppm, which is a factor uh, 80 too high compared to what is allowed in animal feed. So I'm I'm sitting on the fence because I know how to grow this. 
and I've grown this before here in Ireland, even with a similar species, Asparagopsis armata, and that was for a cosmetics company at the time, not knowing that this was coming around uh, 20 years later. So it works for methane reduction. Yes, you do have an issue with with, with bromoform, but at, at normal usage, it would not end up in the milk, but it probably is going to sit somewhere, uh, most probably the liver, but even the livers of cows, we're talking about $11 uh, per liver. So that is a, an economic value. So that is where you're going to look at economic value versus environmental impact. Uh, and what I said, it's much easier to let people eat less meat, like the burger idea, and in that way reduce methane uh, emissions than using something where we actually don't really know what's going to happen. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel, for that question and, and Stefan for that uh, illuminating answer. Uh, well, that, that's been a really interesting round. I mean, the presentations, we started slow, but, you know, it, it's been fast and furious with the questions. And uh, it's great to have you, you know, give us answers in some of these, uh, you know, wide ranging questions that have kind of come across uh, multiple sectors. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to um, having you take part in the Maris concept, you know, in more ways, uh, including in terms of, uh, you know, some of the projects that we are looking at uh, uh, supporting in, in the Pacific and other parts of the world. We're looking forward to seeing how we can engage with you on that. Absolutely. It sounds Great. very interesting. By the way, for Marcel, uh, I'm after the, in, in 10 minutes or so, I'm being picked up and we go sampling for Asparagopsis. Because we still run tests looking at bromoform content in species, what time of the year, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite funny then when you, when you ask that. But uh, yeah, thanks again uh, for the invitation, uh, especially for Nick uh, inviting me and Len for moderating. It was a pleasure, and uh, especially with Jedek with his uh, solution, th there might be a lot of uh, synergies here. So if you have more webinars, uh, just send me the invitation. And if it's getting close to my uh, field of expertise, I'm definitely going to join. Well, you're right at the top. Uh, forgive me snipping in, Len. I just want to say thank you to Stefan, if I may, because. Um, He's, he's been, um, that's been brilliant. And uh, there's a lot of interest here and we will be following up with you um, on the back of the Mares TA. But Len, uh, forgive me for stepping in. Uh, it was just a fair, I knew it was going to be a fair presentation and it was. Great, was. my pleasure guys. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. All right, back to breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Stefan. Bye. Bye-bye.